Hey, hello and welcome to the Feel Strong Fitness Podcast. My name is Justin McClintock and this week we have Dr. Nick Perugini on the podcast. Nick owns More Than Movement, a local Philadelphia facility that combines exercise, education and physical therapy in a unique way that empowers his clients. We dig into changing the discussion from tissue-based diagnoses to functional outcomes, why reframing that discussion is so important, including reframing the mindset that clients often come in with, and how integrating physical therapy and strength-based solutions may well be the future of healthcare. This is an excellent one. Dr. Nick Perugini is on the Feel Strong Podcast. Dr. Nick Perugini, welcome to the Feel Strong Podcast. Thank you, Justin. Thanks for having me. I'm excited to have you here. This has been a little while coming. You are part of our kind of local Philly mini series, but it occurred to me to bring you on because I think we're just over one year in your new location. Is that true? That's correct. Yeah. One year over at our place in uh, Northern Liberties. That's very exciting. Congratulations. Thank you very much. Thank you. We've talked a lot before. We've known each other for a while. I love your business and your business model, but it's a little bit unique. What do you, when someone asks you, what is more than movement? What is it? How do you explain that to them? Yeah, it's a great question. I think there's a reason why, you know, we don't necessarily have physical therapy in the name of the business. There's a reason we don't have strength and conditioning or fitness in the name of the business. And I think that was very intentional. Obviously, with both of those things, people have uh, notions of what that looks like already. And so we were trying to bring something different to the market. And, you know, for that reason, we don't have those names in the business. Now, what we do offer to, uh, tangibly is physical therapy and physical therapy is very broad, but to put it in layman's terms, we help people with a very specific problem get back to doing what they love. And so physical therapy in that sense can be described as problem solving. It can be described as guiding. It can be described as educating and also coaching. Now, we also offer uh, services that extend beyond just that specific problem. I think the problem we solve on more maybe the fitness side is quality of life and physical freedom. And I think every any coach or personal trainer can describe what they do. Yes, we get stronger, we get fitter, we improve our aerobic base, but most people care about very specific things and that's feeling better. However, in whatever domain they want to feel better in, to look better, to function better, to do the things that they want to be able to do. So on our fitness side, it's truly about improving health and health, in, in my opinion, is the ability to say yes to things. And so we're using fitness as our modality to increase preparedness and independence and freedom for the activities that they want to be able to do. So you're describing the ability to take someone from a one-on-one -on -one physical therapy setting with you or one of your staff all the way through potentially an ongoing fitness journey. Yes. And, you know, it's interesting that that is how we call our roadmap where someone is obviously motivated or there's some sense of urgency, right? Because something's taken away from you and we can get into the nitty gritty about how that has come to be. Sometimes it's a traumatic one-time incident. Other times someone has reached a certain threshold or tipping point over six months, you know, over a year, over the COVID era, right? That changed a lot of people's lifestyles and, and behaviors and activities. But regardless, there is a sense of urgency or motivation to address this thing. And a lot of times that person has gone through a tough time to even end up in front of us or scheduling a call. Now, in that process of working together with a physical therapist, whether it's in person or remotely or in our small group individualized settings, they start to learn that there could be something else, right? There could be something more. And so most people don't start with the idea of, oh, I want to address my knee pain and then I want to be able to get really strong. But that's kind of what we introduce through our time working together is, hey, we come up with a specific program and education and advice and guidance and learning experiences through that very specific problem to start. And then we think really the client themselves is able to think or ask, like, what else could I be doing, right? How far can I actually take this once they start seeing results and feeling the results as well? And that's where the fitness comes in. And that to us is the roadmap. And that first, I'm completely behind you. I love this journey. It's obviously, I can't do any of the physical therapy part of it, but I do frequently end up working with people who are, are having pain, have had limitations, can't say yes to the things they want to in their life. 
and trying to take them somewhere else. I know there's coaches listening who are wondering, how much of that conversation do you have with people at the beginning? Someone comes to you with this urgent problem or it's become urgent, as you said. Maybe something just happened to them. Maybe they finally have had enough of not being able to do the things they want to do. They're often focused on that immediate pain. Dr. Nick, I just don't want my knee to hurt anymore. I want to be able to not think about it. How much of that roadmap of, well, we can actually get you back to playing pickup basketball. Maybe I just said a six or nine month journey, but understand knee pain is step one. How much of that and then potentially with more than movement, do you lay up for people? I think starting small is the best. It is important to paint the picture or future cast what it could look like if you travel through that whole roadmap. But most people want tangible evidence early on that they are moving in the right direction, right? And so that's where this kind of phase conversation comes in in goal setting, right? And so what most people look at in this case a sign of progress for them. Maybe the only metric that they're really thinking about is maybe their their pain level, right? And unfortunately, I don't care what anyone says, we don't always have great control over that metric. So assigning what is progress or defining what is progress early on in those stages are really important. And so an example of that would be like in one month, hey, we can't guarantee that your pain will be at zero, but we do want tangible evidence that we're heading in the right direction. And that could be tolerating more activity without symptoms going up. It could be not thinking about your discomfort the first thing in the morning. It could be going down stairs a little bit easier. Whatever those might be, that'll be a very individual metric for person to person. So starting with that mindset, I think is really important, not just to, not to introduce the big picture so quickly, but starting what are the things that we have control over how can we create a program that addresses those things? And I think for maybe the coaches listening as well is understanding how to talk about your exercises in a little different lens, right? We're not just doing this lunge to strengthen your quads. We're doing it so it transfers or correlates to a specific activity or a specific position or a sport that that person wants to be able to, to enjoy. So I think how we talk about our exercises in those early stages are a really important way to build trust, to build buy-in so people can start taking control and understand that movement and exercise can be the missing link to maybe someone's long-term or even acute type of pain or injury. 100%. Do you think of setting those benchmarks for progress and talking about the intention behind the movements in the program as part of the client education? Absolutely. I think most health professionals or strength professionals can very clearly see maybe why even a single leg knee extension could be helpful for someone who has zero quad strength or force development or how a step down can transfer to things like going up and down stairs or how squatting can correlate to being able to bend over during yard work. I don't think most people that are not in our fields can always see those, see that relationship. So I think being clear with why we're doing what we're doing how it's going to transfer and the intention behind it is a really valuable way to educate. And on a, from a population health standpoint, from a global health standpoint, it gives people a different lens on why resistance training and why exercise should be a staple in most people's lives. Because those are the things that create preparedness, that create resilience for people to do the activities they love deep into their lifespan. I've also found describing the intention behind something. I'm thinking of a client I have now who's in his mid forties. And we were doing some single leg plyometric work and he was annoyed. It's not fun. It's really awkward. Balance isn't great. And he kind of slightly exploded at me. He's like, well, why are we doing this? Well, you said you wanted to be able to play basketball with your kid. And so we need to be able to, to change direction. We need to be able to, to cut. And as soon as I said that he suddenly became a more athletic stance and there was more intention behind the movement. I'm not going to say he loves it, but he's excited about it because he hadn't made that connection before. And he was doing this in his mind, isolated, random, weird exercise and just didn't see that connection. I think I feel like that happens. And I'd love to hear your thoughts on this even more in the PT world than in the strict coaching fitness world where people can be doing you know, an isolated movement with a TheraBand and they don't understand what that leads to. When we think traditionally around, around what a physical therapy evaluation or even an orthopedic physician, their evaluation, you can visualize a client maybe lying on the table and the professional moving them around, 
right? And, and really that comes from, that's called an orthopedic assessment where they're checking out the integrity of the ligaments, of the, of the tissue surrounding the body part. And most of the time outside of a traumatic injury, things usually look okay, right? Now, for probably the clients that you're seeing other coaches listening or seeing or other PTs in kind of the, the strength and conditioning or, or fitness type world are seeing, a lot of times those tests don't really tell the whole picture. They don't actually tell and correlate to how the person's moving, right? And then also the symptoms that they're experiencing. And I think this is really the beauty of the evaluation. And I'm not just talking about hamstring flexibility or simply shoulder range of motion. We're talking about a, a movement that challenges a certain part of the body, a certain group of muscles, and trying to link their performance to what they're actually experiencing, right? And, and showing, and you can call it deficiency or a symmetry, or you can look at it as a window of opportunity, right? An area of opportunity. And that's really what we're after when we're in our physical therapy evaluation, trying to find what are these potential patterns, positions, or movements that maybe someone needs a little more attention to that directly correlates to their desired activity, their sport, a lift, right? For example, or whatever is causing or wherever they're feeling their symptoms, right? And, and I think that's like the real beauty. And you can look at that and that is an exercise. And very simply is taking someone through a series of exercises where as the coach or professional, you have an idea of what maybe normal should look like for them uh, or acceptable for their level of activity and their performance determines is that something that we need to spend time on? And is it also correlated to what they're, what they're actually coming in for? That's such a good point. Whenever I speak to younger coaches, one of the things that they get tripped up on is, well, where do I start with this person? Especially in one-on-one -on -one work, right? They've, they've got all this, whatever amount of education and certifications, they've done these things. And someone comes and says, okay, I want A, B, and C. And they get excited and start writing a program. So what are you doing? You don't, anything about this person yet. And I think I just heard you describe an individualized evaluation for someone who comes in. Is that fair to say? Yeah, absolutely. It should flow very dependent on the person's story, right? Their, their presentation and also what they're trying to get after. And that is, first of all, I think that's ideal for a patient who comes into you. I also think it's a hard thing to implement, especially when it's not just you. When you have a staff and you have, it would be easier to have a system where you say, no, 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 it's this eight part assessment. Yep, this is what you on. do. It's this yeah. thing that you do or this endless array of tests that realistically no one's ever going to get through. But let's write every test we can imagine for shoulder strength and rotation and hip internal, internal rotation and so on and so forth. You're talking about, you know, taking the things you need. This person came with this issue. What do we need to know in order to make sure we make progress and take this person where they want to go? Are you implementing that? across multiple people, across a staff? I think it starts with anytime you're looking to scale and create a system and have uniformity within that system, you do need some, what we'd call it maybe shared vocabulary, right? Or a shared language. And so from an assessment standpoint, there are some big buckets, uh, we'll call it, that we, that we want to look at. And so, yeah, from a standard physical therapy standpoint, we have our orthopedic exam. And that's us doing our due diligence at looking at the specific tissue that may be in question that looks like ligament testing, that looks like muscle force testing, some of the basics. But really, 80% of our evaluation looks like a workout. And the actual specific movements that, that we're looking at, I think, start pretty general, and they then get pretty specific. And so for each body part, we probably have maybe five main movements or, or exercises that we are, based on their story, their mechanism of injury, their training experience, we have a good idea of what we call our entry point. And the entry point is how we're actually going into a movement. Let's call it a push-up, for example, right? Are we going to start the movement with a 45-pound plate on their back, doing a deficit push-up? You know, prop for some people, maybe, but that might be their entry point. But using all of that other information that we got from their story, from moving them on the table, from understanding where they're at right now with a level of pain or sensitivity, we've got a good idea of where they need to, need to start. So we have for the shoulder, for the hip, for ankle, for neck, we have maybe a series of five exercises that we're, we're starting with, and that'll be pretty consistent across the board. And then we'll get a little bit more specific 
based on their performance, right? Based on the, the subjective information that we're actually getting from how they're performing these exercises and also try and tailor the exercise to their actual complaint. And so I've messed up many times as a PT by when someone tells me they have pain back squatting and I'm looking at everything in the world but that, right? I think that's one of the, the biggest mistakes that I've made is not actually looking at the movement, trying to get in the weeds at looking at their hip internal rotation for, for five hours and trying to only improve that without having that actually integrate into the movement. And many times we want to get there as quickly as possible, right? We do want to keep the main thing, the main thing. And guess what? That's what coaches are the best at is what can, what variables can you actually control in that one movement? We can adjust range of motion. We can change the external constraints by using a heel wedge, having someone do a hat field variation, using a hack squat against the wall, obviously tempo, right? Weight and volume. Right. And so we want to get there as quickly as possible if it is a, a lifting related type injury. Uh, but for the others, hey, we have our general subset of tests that we're able to kind of get more specific as we're getting more feedback and understanding their tolerance to the exercise, how they're handling it. And then we want to find in that assessment the hardest thing that they do well. Right. And really what that speaks to is that first session is it shouldn't be a spa day. Right. It should be an expectation setting appointment where we want our, our clients to understand that this is going to be uh, challenging. We do want to find something that can make you feel like you're working while monitoring symptoms. Right. It's not saying we're, we're neglecting symptoms, but we do want to give that person a sense of control and power in that, even in that first assessment, showing them that they are not broken and they can handle certain amounts of load. That's so strong. That's such a great way to put it. The hardest thing they can do well, like finding something that is going to be really challenging, but also that you can likely hold up as a win. Look what we did. We pushed it and we're going to build on this. You leave that appointment saying, kind of questioning yourself, right? Saying, okay, I was able to do that. That was the first time I, I sweat in two weeks or actually exerted myself. And, you know, it gives you a sense of relief in a certain way. And in our practice, we see a lot of complex, persistent pain conditions. And really what complex or chronic type pain, what means to me and how I'm going to put this maybe in a different language, is that the symptoms that we are experiencing are not always correlated to a certain tissue, right? Or a damaged tissue. And so... In a case of very persistent and chronic conditions, we have to find something that we can control, right? And if we can control, and also something that gives you power back, that's a really important piece there is that locus of control has been severely affected, right? In that this person likely has seen three to 10 providers over the course of the past five years. They've been told all sorts of things. They've tried many different avenues, whether it be uh, passive care, which has its time and place or motor control activities, but things are, that are not necessarily higher RPE or, or rating of perceived exertion. And so how can we get that person feeling like they are strong, right? They are capable. And even if it's a movement that isn't specifically correlated to their body part, there's still a systemic effect having someone work hard and feel like they did something. It sounds like you're partly talking about deliberately divorcing the diagnoses as it were from the program. You're not chasing down this labrum and making sure the labrum quote unquote feels better or is a hundred percent or something like that. You're after ascent really moving toward their goals. You say you want to squat without pain. Let's work on that and solve that issue. Yeah. And, and obviously there's a time and place where really taking those things into consideration is important. Post-op is just one case right? Where someone does have a healing, a surgery, and there are certain windows, time windows that need to be respected and certain positions that need to be respected for something like a healing ACL graft, for example. But when we're talking about maybe more chronic or training related injuries as well, I'm not sure that those specific tissue based diagnoses are going to matter as much, right? We really are after function, right? And those areas of opportunity. And then having a conversation around programming, 
you're speaking a lot about mindset, about giving people power, giving people control, having some relief after that first session. And even this idea of the person, you know, if someone's been kind of inhabiting their diagnosis, if they're, well, I just have a bad back or I have a this disc issue or something like that. How important do you think that kind of mindset work and mindset education is for people? Yeah, I think it's really important. I think our the name of our company is named after it. That's what more of the movement alludes to is that there's a big power in that. And yeah, you know, this is kind of my crazy hill that I, I stand on is that most people can get themselves in a really tough spot or get themselves out of a really tough spot with better decision making. Right. And so decision making, I think, is a blend of knowledge. Yeah. And mindset and attitude. And so, yeah, you do need the education around some of these things, but you know, you also have to kind of change how we're thinking as well. And so the example of that is someone has back pain uh, after deadlifting and they grew up in a household where their parents or high school strength coaches or, or just sport coaches told them, yep, you need to get a bag of peas on that for the next three weeks, shut it down, right? Rest in bed. Don't, don't do anything. Just stretch your hamstrings and that's it. These are very deep beliefs that form early on. And so now all of a sudden that person's 25, same thing happened. This time it's a little bit worse. They rested, they iced, did the whole thing, uh, except this time it's not getting better. So they go to an orthopedic surgeon who tells them never bend, lift, or twist your spine ever again, right? And that, that is, that's a dagger, right? When someone in an authoritative position tells you these things and you have full blind trust in them, um, that's going to change, it's going to change your life. Uh, it's going to change your beliefs. The beliefs are going to change your actions and the actions are going to influence your current state, right? And so that's how people kind of get into these positions that are really tough. It's not just one decision. It's a decade. It's two decades of believing a certain thing. The belief leads to the action. The action leads to the state, right? So to get out of that, that tough spot, it's not just me saying, do these exercises, or this is the exercise to, you know, cure you. There needs to be a little bit of an unlearning process. It creates room for reframing. And so in that example, the reframe is that, hey, this very specific part of your spine may not just be, may not solely be the issue. Instead, we need to actually think about your body as an ecosystem that responds to its environment, right? Can we just blame the plant for not growing? Or can we talk about the sunlight, the placement, the water, who's tending to it, the soil, all of these other factors that have a complex experience on our function and really our pain, which is the motivating factor in this case. And so that, that learning process is tough. And truthfully, what I'll say is that the most powerful lesson for that person is not going to be the thing that I say or teach them, but it is going to be what they experience and feel, right? And that doesn't happen in a session. A lot of times it doesn't happen in two weeks or four weeks, but there needs to be like a sliver of hope. There needs to be a decent amount of trust and trust is funky, right? It could be from that trust could have been from a Google review or a word of mouth referral. It could have been a, a lot of these other things that maybe we had on our side leading up to that appointment, but we need a little bit of that because that person isn't going to change overnight. And that's the hard thing about chronic pain is that you know, very, very rarely is there going to be a silver bullet, but to get out of that tough spot, there needs to be some kind of shakeup in how we're thinking about the world or their lens of how they're viewing their pain or their body. And then we have to start building some other accessory pieces of information in there. And those could be stories. Those could be analogies. Or I think most importantly, it could be using an example of what they report and helping them decipher what that actually means. The example there would be, you know, actually when I took that four-day vacation from work, my back felt great, Right. That's an example of the actual structure of the back is, is not changing, but the system has changed, right? So there are external factors outside of this very specific vertebrae that are influencing how we feel, right? The other example would be, hey, we've been working together for three weeks now. They've been very consistent with their program, thankfully. And you know what? Actually, 
my back pain, I'm not really feeling my back until like 3 p.m. now versus I was feeling at like 10. Finding these things and relating that story to maybe what's happening. And in that story specifically, that would be the example of capacity, right? We're actually building capacity. Did we change anything you know, in that specific area? Not necessarily, but your body is responding favorably. And that piece of evidence is what we're after. Because if we can get one piece of evidence, we can get another and we can build off that. You're describing really empathetic, really careful listening to an individual story so you can find a way in to, because you're working on, you know, potentially breaking beliefs between inherited wisdom, right? This is, we're going to rice no matter what things they've been told by other experts, whether they're medical professionals, other coaches or whomever, and having to weave through these things to change their mindset and literally change how they see their own situation. I would agree. And that's why my unique belief here is that I'm not sure that the ultra specifics of what you're doing in certain cases are going to be the biggest lever here, right? But I think most people who have a, I would say, and it's hard to just kind of throw that out there, but maybe a solid knowledge base and experience of training, right? How far you have to go from a program design standpoint to get someone in a great spot. And that to me is where even if you have the best program, but you haven't done some of the unlearning and reframing and helping people understand their unique situation and what they are feeling and how to maybe take that story and put a new lens on what that story could mean. I think that is the thing that makes the program even more effective, right? That to me is the more the movement piece. We talk about seeing the human being, when we're, especially when we're talking to other coaches. I think this is what you're talking about. It's easy, especially as a the kind of technician side of a, a coach's brain, especially, to fall down the rabbit hole and just build the perfect program. Like, actually, I'm going to have a staggered stance landmine press here. Yeah, because I can use the slings and do that. And all of that is potentially correct. But none of it's going to work if you aren't actually connecting with the person and describing how you're solving the problem and making sure you're meeting them where they are. Yeah. If that person remembers, you know, doing power cleans at high school and that's what made them feel strong and feel capable, you might need to put power cleans in your program at some point just Definitely. to watch their eyes light up. Is it the best pulling movement in the world? Yeah, probably not. Is it the right thing for that person? Yeah. Yeah. And I think uh, that you kind of talk about what works, right? And I think what works is a real, it's a tricky thing, right? Because work really has to be defined. And, you know, again, there most people in coming into this scenario, you know, pain is the most important thing for them, right? And, and obviously we want to dig a little deeper than that. There's always a next level, right? Really pain becomes very real when it robs you from something or takes away from something. And so I think the next layer of defining work for me is, you know, is it just about getting the pain away, right? Because if that was the case, right, most people can just wrap themselves up in bubble wrap, you know, sit on the couch, will probably be okay, right? Time will do its thing. You're going to put yourself in no risk and just, you're going to be good, right? And again, I think that this could be the allure sometimes of manual therapy, right? Of things like chiropractic adjustments, dry needling, grass in soft tissue massage. Sure, it can help anyone possibly, right? But a lot of times it is a coin flip. And so going to see someone and thinking that you've done rehab when you've had these things done to you and maybe have modulated your nervous system in a certain way, have distracted what you're actually sensing and feeling or altered your the messages coming to your brain and altering what you're experiencing without the education, without the assessment and understanding like what are those opportunities and how are those correlated to what I am trying to do. I think sometimes that can rob someone of a more sustainable and long-term solution. And that's something that I've experienced in my own practice over the years, right? Is that now I'm in a situation where we're not working directly with insurance. There is a higher fee per session and I take a lot of responsibility in what do I feel is the best use of our time, right? Because I do not want to waste it. And I also 
want to make sure that the experience that they're getting doesn't just help them for an hour after that session, but helps them far beyond that, especially in the cases of people who've been experiencing their condition and their normal for the past five, 10 years, more and more persistent type injury. And so something's got to change there. And 10 out of 10 times, if someone comes in, they said, I've tried this, 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 I'm not doing it because I'm not going to believe that my method of putting a needle in someone is better or my method of cracking someone's back is better than another person's, especially as if it hadn't resulted in, in long-term success, right? And so that to me is a sign that something's got to change there. And that's where we need to start unpacking some things and, and kind of understanding what their view of their body is, I'm not saying it's wrong, but maybe introducing some alternative lens and then to put it short, get to work. And I think that's really admirable for a couple of reasons. The biggest one being is that it sounds to me like you're describing how to have a client patient graduate. So if someone comes to you, I've had this chronic pain, I've seen eight different people, this is my issue. You are not going to, even if they ask for it, you are not going to give them dry needling, cupping, an adjustment twice a week for the next 10 years. The plan is maybe some of those approaches can open a short-term window where we can get some other work done. That's how I often, I have different views on all of these things, but a lot of these kind of, especially the manual therapies can open a window. I can move a little more now. I, I'm in a little less discomfort. Excellent. This is the time, this is an opportunity to do the work that's going to move you forward, not wait to backslide so you can get the same manual therapy again. I don't want to put words in your mouth. That's an approach yeah. I frequently no, I think take. That's kind of the supporting phrase, uh, right? It's like, hey, you know, using manual therapy to get that window of opportunity to, to then move again. But in my opinion, you're still relying on something and that is fine, right? And that, and it can change lives, right? It's, I hear the story all the time, but they're also sitting in front of me now. So I understand that it is an extremely powerful tool. I'm trained in it. I use it very sparingly because of the decision of this is the time that we have and we have to be able to prioritize decision-making. So what is that going to be? But as you point out, you're not always going to have access to those things. So when I think about freedom of health or freedom, uh, physical freedom, being able to say, yes, you know, health, that also means dealing with pain. That also means our response to it. That also means how we're viewing setbacks, right? Every single person, all of our staff, physical therapists, strength coaches, uh, we've had injuries in the past year, right? That were horrible, right? And, 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 and they stink. But your response to it, and really this goes back to the decision-making process, how you're interpreting that information. And now the decisions that you make, yes, when you are in pain, become really important. Right. And so I always think about it myself and maybe you do too. What is the advice that you would give yourself in this situation? If you were in that person's shoes, what advice would you be giving them? And if you would be sticking yourself with a needle or trying to crack your back, great. Then maybe that's what you're going to do. In our case, especially a training related injury or like, you know, things pop up, right? Play pickleball, you swing a bat, you know, you're, you're kind of old all of a sudden. You haven't done, not to say you're old, but you haven't done it in a while. Things pop up and here it goes, right? So what goes into your head first? Generally, my first reaction, I'm going to be pissed, right? I'm going to be upset. I'm going to be cursed. I'm going to be a little upset with myself, right? Then it's like, okay, can I move, right? Can I do small movements? Can I do larger movements, okay? Can I train legs? Can I do something else? Can I go for a walk? Can I reflect on my past week? Did I travel? Was I out of routine? Was I in a hotel? Was I on a flight? Was I drinking? Was I you know, not eating right? Right. I'm reflecting and saying, yeah, maybe I was kind of out of alignment this past uh, week, maybe month. Right. And then, hey, what can I do moving forward to start getting on on track? And what, what were the things that would be really, really scary to maybe have me reach out to someone? But most people don't have that thought process right after a certain injury. So, again, in the case of how we're teaching, people get themselves in a really tough spot through those decisions over time and people get them out of a really tough spot through those decisions over time. How important do you, is it for you in the way that you and more than movement works to be able to blend the physical therapy and kind of strength and conditioning side of it to be able to move across that spectrum? Yeah, I think it's really important. And the business model came from how I was practicing as a physical therapist. And actually it wasn't even just how I was practicing. 
it was kind of the response I was getting and then maybe some of the gaps that I saw in that traditional physical therapy within in the rules of insurance, right? You can only get reimbursed for some certain things, right? You're supposed to help people get back to their daily life, right? Sitting on a toilet, going up and down stairs, doing their job, right? You're not getting reimbursed by big insurance companies to help people squat or deadlift or power clean or do push-ups or to run even, right? So there's a little bit of creative storytelling that you have to play if you're in that game playing by the rules in an in-network practice. What I found and what we experienced were that people wanted to, to keep going out of these acute conditions, right? And so that's where, hey, you start to introduce remote programming as a side, right? Using softwares like True Coach, Train, uh, train Heroic, Team Builder to give a little bit more, right? That's not just physical therapy anymore, right? It kind of progresses into something more sustainable, but specific, also being general from a fitness standpoint, but it is specific to their person. And so I saw that for a long time is that that's how people were ending up using my services. And then I think what it also does it in our environment, it breaks the belief that someone can't continue to be strong, right? Where I went to physical therapy and that's it. I'll back up a second. Most people will ask, how long do I have to keep doing this? Right? Well, I have to do this forever is a big question. And that probably, that is a question that most physical therapists get. It's a question that probably most coaches get as well. And it's okay to ask that question. And that's not a bad question. It's a real question. I do think that the client a lot of times will be able to answer that question as they continue to work with you and as they continue to learn about their body and how it responds to stress and also what they're doing outside of the gym, right? You see, and you start to look at it like, oh, I get to do these things or I want to do these things because it allows me to do this, right? Versus you need to do this for eight months to be better. Right. And so if people do have an activity that they love, you know, whether it's basketball, whether it's hiking, whether it's running, sometimes the stuff that we do in the PT world or in the strength and conditioning world, they end up seeing that transfer. And when they can feel the transfer, that question gets answered by itself. Right. So I'm always very hesitant to give a direct answer. I'm, I'm usually a little bit more political in my answers with something like that, but that's where the training becomes helpful. Right. Because a lot of times that, that general strength and conditioning program, that checks a lot of buckets, especially for someone that coming into physical therapy had a lower training age or an unhealthy relationship with training. And an unhealthy relationship with training can be on two ends of the spectrum. It could be that I was doing a program that was not designed for me, maybe it was way too much volume, way too much intensity, and it wasn't integrating into their life well. The other person could have been, I've been doing a lot of different things, kind of picking and choosing, but not having a, a more progressive thing, maybe with super high intensity, a lot of cardio, not maybe not a lot of strength and conditioning. And that's another example. And so for that person to be able to find a sustainable general physical preparation program that checks a lot of buckets for them after physical therapy is a great way for them to continue their progress in a way that's sustainable for them. And that's why we call it sustainable fitness. And I think that speaks to a certain person. It's not supposed to speak to everyone. Well, that actually leads to my next question, because I'm unsurprisingly very on board with everything you're saying and giving people this kind of individualized program. I often find when they do it and they see what the results and they see that they feel better and they see that they can do all the other things they want to do, they start enjoying the stuff. I've absolutely had people say, you know, I'll give you eight weeks and then I'm never walking in and I hate gyms. I don't like coming to the gym. And those people are now like, Hey, I saw the program. Can we lift some weights today instead? I, I really want to lift some weights. Who is an ideal more than movement client patient? What's the right word? I keep going back and forth. I'm being, I'm trying to say the right thing. And I actually realized it's kind of both. Yeah, it is, it is both. And also it doesn't matter. It's the person. I think our sweet spot is someone who's had a really tough time building consistency from recurrent injury. Someone who knows deep down, they do want to be active, right? They can see their friends. They can see their family members being active doing the things they want to do without hesitation. And that person doesn't have that. There's worry, there's hesitation, there's fear, there's anxiety. There probably is a true injury that they've had, right? And that has set them back, whether it was a surgery or something that left them in a boot, a cast, a crutches, whatever it might be. And they were never really fully able to get out of that position. The second person from the actual physical therapy side, right, is the person who has seen four or five professionals in the past year, two years, three years, 
that has lost their fitness, that has lost control, has lost power, who spent a lot of time laying on the table, not a lot of time doing the work. So for the people who are still have a sliver of hope and have not found success yet, that's the person that we work with. Is there anything, I'm sure the answer is yes. Let me ask a better version of this question. What would make someone not a good fit to work with you? Are there things that someone would present with, whether it's conditions or mindset or situations that you would be like, actually, this isn't, I don't think this is going to work. I'm going to refer you out or kindly pass you along. Yeah. I think within our model, as I was talking about before, I think someone who is dead set, unwilling to open their mind to alternatives to just passive care. Right. And a lot of people do have that a notion that, yeah, I'm going to get a half-assed massage at physical therapy. Um, and it's just, it's just something that we're not probably going to do. Now, we do have people that we do have professional athletes, semi-professional athletes, college athletes. And these are people that are with us many days a week, right? We're pretty much in full control of their program. And when a lot of boxes are checked, you know, those are things that we'll, we'll include in their program. But most people are not kind of checking the boxes on the basics. Not that you just have to, you have to work hard to, to deserve that, but within our time together in the context of being able to create priorities of what is important because our results are on the line too, those are things that, those are decisions that we're going to make. So someone coming in purely looking for that kind of treatment, generally what we do is we send about 10 clinics that are within a half mile of that person's address on an email right away. I love that you keep coming back to not only is this going to be effective, but is this going to be efficient? Is this a good use? We only have so much time. I don't know. You know, I don't have any guarantee I'm going to see this person for another X sessions. What's the best thing to do right now? You mentioned this sometime today too. Like it needs to look similar, right? Those sessions should look similar to how it's going to look in a year and two years and five years when you're doing it on your own, you know? And so I think one of the most powerful experiences that you can give someone is to teach someone how it feels, right? Feels to either work on this specific thing, how it feels to navigate a setback, some of the tools that we can provide to you know, help manage that, that really tough spot. Managing a setback is the most powerful tool in our world. It is complete independence. If you have the power to be able to withstand that and have someone there with you to help you through that, when it comes back, inevitably because life is pain, it will. And you'll be a little bit more equipped. Your response and your reaction to that will be different. But yes, the efficiency piece, the decision-making piece, those are life skills, right? I think every person should have a certain level of autonomy in some of those skills. And those are going to, you know, some, an example would be auto-regulation, right? Knowing how to work out even when you don't feel a hundred percent. Another skill would be knowing how to go to a hotel gym and create a workout, right? Another one would be, hey, how to actually do a warm up set and not freak out if your knee hurts on, on rep four, right? And adjust your stance, adjust your tempo, go with a different variation for that day, right? Big picture population health standpoint, right? We don't want orthopedic issues to become metabolic issues. So worst case scenario is that you're dealing with someone with an orthopedic issue, Again, that's shoulder, back, knee, hip pain. We rob them from movement. They wrap themselves in bubble wrap. And yes, they're safe on their couch, but now we have a metabolic condition, right? So big scheme, big picture stuff here. How can we keep people moving? How can we give them a positive experience with movement and give them the education and decision-making skills to, to lead them into a longer quality of life? I love that. That's amazing. Dr. Nick, I want to be respectful of your time. There's people out there who definitely want to find you and get in touch. Some of them live in Philadelphia. Some of them don't. I also wouldn't be surprised if there's some coaches and physical therapists who want to get in touch and be like, how do I come work at a place like this? Would you tell people where they should go, how to find you, anything else they should know? I'm always open for a call. I love connecting. I love getting on a Zoom or a phone call and hear more about people's stories and what they're up to. Not long ago, I was you know, interning all over the city and emailed 20 gyms, I think my freshman year at Temple and it's like, let me scrub your toilets and, and be an intern. So I, I'm always, always open to chat. But um, easiest way you can get me is Nick at morethemovement.com. On Instagram, we're, we're pretty busy over there too. My personal handle, Nick Perigini, DPT, or morethemovement.pt. 
I'd be happy to set something up and, and chat more. That's absolutely amazing. I will put all of that in the show notes. So if you're listening to this, you can probably look down at your device and click one of those things to either email, reach out, DM. I feel like we could talk for another hour. I know you have a busy day. Thank you so much for coming on the podcast. Thanks so much, Justin.